Thank you, Ona. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Slush 100 Finals. This is the pitching competition where 100 early stage startups were selected to present their company. That group was narrowed down to 20 semi finalists who we all saw at the startup studio just yesterday. And today, the three finalists have the chance to win it all here on Founder Stage. This competition embodies everything Slush is all about, helping early stage startups on their journey. Ever since our first event 13 years ago, this mission has inspired countless people to come to Helsinki and see what the latest success stories are and learn how they can help the community. It is what uh, has driven 1,700 investors to come to the cold north and see what the next and most impactful companies that they can work with are. It is what has mobilized 1,100 volunteers here today to give their time to help the entrepreneurs to find what they need here. It's their yes we can attitude that makes Slush possible in the first place. And as young people, they will be the ones driving the change in the future. And most importantly, it's why 3,200 startup founders and operators have come here to build their teams and companies to take the leap on their journey in solving the most pressing issues in the world today. A total of 8,800 people have come here today because the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and here at Slush 2021, it is as strong as it has ever been. This year is the 10th anniversary of Slush 100. Organized since 2011, the winner has always left with a package to help them keep building their company and benefit from the greatest minds that we have here. This year, the winner's package is composed of the following prizes. We have up to $100,000 in AWS promotional credits, as well as up to $10,000 in AWS business support credits. Tickets to Slush 2022 and media and investor visibility, uh, along with an interview for Slush Media, Slush News. One year of Pitch Pro for free and a swag pack for the winning team. And last but not least, each of the jurors here today will give one hour of free mentoring time to the winning team. Now, you of course want to know who is on the jury this year then. Well, sitting up here next to the stage, we have principal at General Catalyst, Juliet Balin. <laughs> next, we have founding partner at Maki VC, Ilka Kivimäki. Our third judge is partner at Cherry Ventures, Sophia Bentz. Fourth judge on our panel is partner at EQT Ventures, Ted Persson. And finally, we have partner at YesVC, Yuri Engström. Thank you for being here, jurors, for helping make this competition possible today. We'd also like to thank the Slush 100 partners, Amazon Web Services, and Pitch for their support in making the competition happen. So, the time has come. Are you ready to start the Slush 100 finals? Good, very good. It's buzzing like a beehive in here, so let's get started. Our first finalist is Vitroscope, a company whose goal it is to find novel drug targets with just a laptop, running mechanobiological experiments on demand automatically. Here is their co-founder and CEO, Carlo Kriesi, to pitch. Carlo, please. Hello, everyone. Absolute honor to stand up here. My name is Carlo. I'm CEO and co-founder of Vitroscope. We enable lifelike biology experiments at scale. Last year, our test users have already found four potential new drug targets that you can never discover on a traditional biology experiment. This year, they were not only able to confirm these results, they also did a bunch more, which is awesome. And not only that, we also ship the first batch of our products to our first paying customers, including very prestigious ones like Harvard Medical School. 
The fundamental problem that we are attacking is that when we develop medicine, drugs, we develop them for very active, moving human beings. We are very complex bundle of cells, and all of these cells experience a lot of stimuli, including actually a lot of mechanical forces. But when we develop drugs, we develop them and test them in, in these plastic dishes where there's none, or almost none, of these stimuli. And it's therefore not such a big surprise that over 90% of these drugs fail in the R&D pipeline, and that creates a $100 billion problem. If you look at this process a bit more in detail, not only is the failure rate very high, it's also extremely important to see that one third of the promising compounds actually fail in the very last stage, in the most expensive stage, where we test the drugs on human patients. That's just not a monetary problem, it's also a health problem. If you have a rare condition maybe, you're suffering from it, there's a very small chance that you ever get a treatment because the risk of developing for these few patients is just so, so large. And that brings me to our vision. Our vision is to de-risk the drug R&D process. Our vision is a zero-risk drug R&D. We are already today helping our customers to make their initial experiments more lifelike, more accurate. They can simulate what will happen to the cells in the human patient. We want to scale this so we can help the industry save billions in R&D costs, make their clinical trials more predictable, and ultimately get more drugs out on the market to help more people. Our first product, our first step towards that vision, is enabling the live observation of living cells in lifeline conditions. So it's basically as if you were looking into the bloodstream of a human patient, but in the safety of your laboratory. We do this with a very nice piece of hardware. It's a compact platform that allows our users to do exactly that, to look at cells in, life, in, in the live setting and see how they would react as if they were in a human patient. And what sets us apart is that we're fully online. So we create in our cloud a digital twin of what is going on on our device. So that allows us to help our customers with software solutions so they can better prepare, run, and also analyze their experiments. And that's very nice. Because think of it this way. We're selling our customers like a remote control, a physical thing that they can use and they can try on and test on until they find the one thing that is really well working. And they use our cloud to capture and analyze this data all the way. So we are in the loop. So we can remotely start scaling their most promising protocols once they don't need 10 data points, but once they need 10,000, right? And the beauty is once you have this cycle running, I don't need to explain this audience, I don't think the importance of data and the power of accurate large amounts of data, you can really start playing around with it. And who knows, maybe in the future, we're going to become the most efficient biotech company in the world. Well, still a long way until there, but we're working on it. Who's we? We, that's my great friend and co-founder, CTO, software engineer, uh, Heike Sherman, from here, from Helsinki originally. Um, it's our biologist, Vendela. She's actually using our products in the laboratory today, in part to better understand her own condition. And me, originally a biomedical engineer, CEO, and co-founder. In addition, we have a nice network of advisors that help us with any questions we may have. To push these efforts forward, we're raising 750,000 euros right now. Um, so if this resonates with you, if you want to hear more, then please reach out. You have the details. Just don't wait too long. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Look forward to your questions. Hi. Hey. Wow, that was loud. Um, so the discovery engine, yeah. um, what does it do? It's, it's, a, it's an imaging solution. Is it like an optical image, imaging solution, or how does it work? Um, you, you, you use the optical solution around it. So it's, uh, it's a, an integrated technology where, where you expose the cells to um, a, a flow-induced mechanical stress. So we, we, we leverage certain physical um, fluid dynamical effects so that we can very controlled and use forces on the cells, and you can live look at that. Gotcha. So, so, so the Discover Engine is, is the machine that adds the sort of stress, and then you use 
other exist, already existing optical solutions to... That's, that's correct, yeah. We're okay. actually working on our own optical solutions as well, so we can even more integrate the whole systems, but that's a... Uh, still needs some steps. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a great presentation. I'd love to hear more about your go-to-market strategy and sort of who you're selling to in the end. Yeah, so um, w w the pharmaceutical market is an extremely tricky conservative market. So, so pharmaceutical companies state themselves that you know 99% of their um, research happens outside of them, so they just buy up technologies. But where pharmaceutical development starts is in the universities. It's the PhDs, the, the, the postdocs that spend their weekends in the lab. So that's our initial customers. They are eager to try out new technologies um, and, and, and you know, find new results. And they're the ones who develop, uh, find these new targets, who, who find these new compounds, um, just to then at some point get into the pharmaceutical cycle. Um, so that, that's one thing we do, and that's what we focus on a lot right now. Um, what we also start to work on, now that we have some credibility that we can actually deliver something, is we reach out to um, top 20 uh, pharmaceutical companies where we're now also in discussions with where uh, it, it's about establishing workflows that fits into their long-term strategy about you know, removing mice models from the pipeline, for example. Um, so that's a much, much longer sales cycle, I would say, but that just takes a lot of R&D efforts, but we can luckily use our, our same established platform um, to, to help them in that. So. You talk about the importance of data, and obviously with any of any analytical platform, the quality of the data is going to impact the result. So in order to determine toxicity, or you talk about the viability of any particular drug, um, what data sources are you using, either within the pharma companies or, or elsewhere? Right. So we're not using external sources right now at all, no. So we, we're training our models on our own developed data, like the one we generate. So um, if, you, if you look at cells in, in, in like, let's take, for example, brain cells in a, a static plastic dish, you will get completely different results than on our device. And, uh, or, or let's take the example of the, the, these drug candidates. It's actually related to a disease, a kidney disease that affects over 400 million in the wor people in the world. Um, you will not find these results ever in any existing data set that you can have. So right now, we're really building this. We will have to see where we can actually tap into existing platforms, but it's maybe a bit too early to, to go into the in-depth in that one, yeah? How about, how about the IP? Uh, I guess that in every experiment, you, you would be gaining a lot of knowledge to the platform, but uh, I think that then it's the quarrel that who owns it. Do you already have a hunch how it goes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, it's a never-ending discussion on that one. Um, there, there's there's multiple models, but I think what what is fundamentally important is that if if I look at your cells uh, that you do an experiment on, without your research question, it's just images. I don't know what you did, why you did it, and what you're looking for. Are you looking for more or less? I don't know. But we can still capture, for example, cell death. It's still a fact that the cells died and we can feed this into our models. That is independent of why they die and what compound you use to make them die. That is yours. That is now, let's say, a pharmaceutical context. But in a research context, um, researchers are much more open to share experiences, data. They want their publication, but the publication is, well, it's published. And so there is much more freedom to capture a lot more data. There's also the model of if I run an experiment for you and you ask for 20 different proteins to be analyzed, well, there's many more that we can analyze that we don't need to sell you, but we can still do it. And that data we can retain as well. So there's, there's many ways how we can find a way through this. And I think the world is ready, also the pharmaceutical world, to more digitalized solutions in that sector. And that is all the time we have for you. Thank you very much, Carlo, again, Thank you. for your pitch. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. All right, moving on to our next finalist. It is a company called Hormona. Their home test helps women to test their hormones on a regular basis so they can be better aware of their health. Let's welcome co-founder and COO, Yasmin Tageson. Hi, 
everyone. I'm Jasmine, CEO and co-founder of Hormona. We're empowering women to live better and healthier lives through taking control of our hormones with the help of AI and at-home testing. Hormonal health sits at the very center of women's health. And by 2025, hormonal health could be a $50 billion industry. But where are the unicorns? Today, 80% of all women suffer from hormonal imbalances, which in turn affect our cycles, fertility, and general well-being. By controlling the most essential body functions, our hormones play a key role in our overall health and affect us women on a daily basis throughout life. Our hormones are constantly changing and changing a lot. But who guides us through these massive hormonal changes? Who tells us if a change is expected, normal or abnormal? Today, no one. But this is what we're on a mission to change. Hormona was created to empower women to live happier and healthier lives in harmony with her hormones. Our goal is to save millions of women the cost and pain of going through the same journey as our founder Carolina did, and to develop an affordable way for women to track and understand her hormones to allow for easier transitions through the various stages of a woman's life. The first part of our end-to-end -end solution is our app, which actually launched on the startup stage about an hour ago. And <laughs> the app allows women like myself to first of all, get a better understanding of my hormones. But it also allows me to track and monitor my hormonal symptoms, improve on said symptoms through 12-week action plans, and engage with other women in our community. Next up in the pipeline is our home hormone test, which is the first quantitative at-home hormone test testing the most essential biomarkers, which we feel is a very natural next step, complementing our existing digital solution. Our patent pending test is very easy to use. You simply take it in the morning, once a week, and scan it with your mobile camera. And by testing regularly, we can help confirm if you are going into menopause, will have problems getting pregnant, or pick up any hormonal changes that may impact your life. The company is a result of my co-founder and our CEO, Carolina's personal struggle with health and well-being. I joined the team because of our long-lasting friendship and previous startup history. But we also have Max, our CTO, with over 15 years' experience in building technical solutions. Adina, our CPO, specializing in growth and digital health products. Our gynecologist, Katerina, who was the first chief medical officer for Flow, the period tracking app. And our endocrinologist, Dr. Rocio salas Wallen, who is the ultimate hormone expert. And together we have over 25 years combined technical and medical experience. The global women's health market is substantial, and with hormonal health sitting at its center, and with 80% of women affected, the potential market is huge. Whenever we tell people what we do, they all ask, how does this not already exist? And we ask the same thing. So if not now, then when? Data is so desperately needed to improve women's health, as a prolonged gender data gap has meant that women's hormonal health has more or less been ignored. Hormonal health in itself is desperately underserved. And by being first movers in this space, we have the opportunity to claim an entire market that is currently completely untapped. We have the opportunity to contribute to narrowing the data gap in women's health and improve health outcomes for 50% of the world's population. Every single woman will be affected by her hormones, and it's time we stop ignoring that. Our business model is direct to consumer subscription, and our prices are based on in-depth customer research and interviews, but we also see a huge financial opportunity in working with clinics and digital health companies. So how will we go to market? Firstly, we will utilize our existing community of over 11,000 women and continuous organic growth, but we're also partnering up with both insurance and telehealth companies to quickly reach as many women as possible. We're right now in discussions with both a large telehealth company that sees over 1 million women a month and a large insurance company that has over 2 million female customers. We're currently raising one and a half million pounds and we have a third of our round committed. So if anyone thinks this sounds interesting, please come find me after this. I'd love to tell you more. And now, feeling hormonal should be the start of a conversation, not the end. Join us on our quest to change the future of women's health. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for a great presentation. Love to thank see you. that you're building this. 
Um, I'm a big fan of what you're doing, and I agree with you that it, it's a shame that it, nothing similar had been built before. So talking about your journey and building this unicorn, when you plan to sort of hire and attract top-tier talent, what are some of the thoughts you have on building culture and growing your organization? It's a very good question. And I think, um, obviously, everyone wants to build a great organization where people want to stay and work and have a great work-life balance. At the stage we're in right now, we're just working really hard on getting this product to as many women as we can. Um, but obviously, hiring top talent is super important, and that's the best way for us to become the unicorn in hormonal health. Hey, thanks for the great presentation, Yuri from Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, diagnostic test you're using um, and accuracy, specificity, sens sensitivity, so on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the test in itself, I guess the easiest way to describe it is similar to a pregnancy test. It's a mid-flow urine uh, test. And the process of it and what's unique with what we're doing is that we don't have a separate hardware. Your mobile is actually the lab. So we've developed a software that reads the intensity of the test line that gives the quantitative test result. So we've cut out the lab, we've cut out the separate hardware, and it's a simple at-home urine test. Um, and in terms of specificity and sensitivity, they're all about positive, you know, enough positive corrects and enough negatives correct. Um, but our test always has a positive test line because that's how we measure it. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Thanks. I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is you know, what exactly are you measuring? Oh, we're measuring um, estrogen, progesterone, and FSH, which are the three main hormones to understand the women's hormonal health. Cool, thanks. <laughs> You talk about the, uh, the enormous data gap in women's health, which I think is indisputable at this point. Um, and yet you also talk about helping women figure out what's normal or abnormal for them or expected. However, there's a tension there. If we don't have enough data about women, it's difficult to understand what normal is. How do you think about that problem? No, of course. And I think part of what we want to do is obviously help narrow that gap so there isn't as much of a discrepancy. But... Um, with our test, a woman has to test for a minimum of three cycles. That way we establish what your normal is. And hopefully with that, we can then understand what the greater normal is. Because maybe we don't even know what the right normal is at the moment. <laughs> How often do women measure? Is it daily, once a week? It's, it's four times a cycle, so roughly once a week. It's the easiest way to describe it. So it's still very user-friendly. It's not something you have to do every single day, but we can still give you enough insights and predictions so that you know what's going on in your body at any one time and how you can optimize your life around that. No more questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jasmine. Our third and final finalist is Helpy. They have redesigned elder care so that customers receive a single point of contact for all services and guidance and a platform to reach any healthcare professional they might require. Welcome to the stage, Helpy founder and CEO, Richard Nordstrom. Hi, I'm Richard, and I'm from Helpy. And at Helpy, we care about elderly. Elderly care is under pressure in Europe, and the symptoms are showing. Soon we have a nurse shortage of 7 million, and family members are spending 33 billion hours annually helping their loved ones as the system is broken. How did we end up here? Well, first, it was easy. We had few seniors, and we had the means to use expensive care homes. Then came the push to more affordable home care, just to realize that, just, uh, that that isn't enough. The problem is that the traditional elderly care system and the model isn't scalable. 
And why is that? Well, there's a limited innovation in this field, and there's also, in the traditional care model, there's very few economies of scale. And this leads to a very fragmented market of small players. And just in Germany, in Berlin, you have 496 care providers. And the problem from the user experience point of view, if you're a family member, is that typically now in today's care, you need to visit your loved one before and after work because you, nurses are always changing and the reporting is a black box. Then during the workday, you need to coordinate most of the services and they come, as they come from different providers. And then at evenings, you need to sort out a lot of the paperwork as you're no care professional and there's really no one who you can call. I was in this situation a few years ago when I was working at BCG. And as most of you in the audience, I also thought that when I get old, the system will take care of me. But I was wrong. At Helpy, we're doing two things. The first thing is that we're creating a user experience as a family member would want it. And the second part is we're bringing a scalable model to elderly care. How are we doing this? Well, we're bringing a single point of contact for all services and guidance. We're offering peace of mind at your fingertips so you can always know that your parent is okay. And we're bringing a tech-enabled platform model that allows us to cut travel and billability waste. We can automate coordination and re recruiting. We can enable self-management on the field and create a good experience overall. And this allows us to pay higher salaries to nurses. We have a great team with complementary skill sets and we're backed by three investors who believe in our mission and who have built similar unicorn, unicorns in similar fields. And we have, gr we have great product market fit with almost 100% customer retention and as many services have moved online during recent years and become tech enabled, first home delivery, then healthcare was digitalized, we're seeing that care is now being tech enabled as well. We come from Finland, one of the most advanced home care markets in the world, and we're launching to Europe in January. So to all you in the audience who are balancing work, your own family, and caring for an aging parent, you are no longer alone. Visit us at helpy.com or helpy.fi and test our family portal at app.helpy.com. Thank you. Great stuff. I loved how you skipped Sweden on your way out uh, to, uh, to Europe there. Well, <laughs> Finns typically go to Sweden first, but maybe we're different. Um, could you talk a bit more about who you sell to and how that would work? Yeah, so we have both private pay customers and then public pay. So we tap into both sources. I think most, uh, most when, you're, when you're a startup like us and you want to scale fast, you typically tap into the private pay side first, which is very much customer driven, where you can innovate fully and you don't have a like, public pay rule book that, that sets the way you innovate. But then you can absolutely, as we've done, tap into public pay further on. Got it. And in terms of services, you had a slide there with video conferencing that you skipped over pretty quickly. Is, is that one of the pieces of your offering? Yeah, so what we do is we do visits as a, as a platform model, peer-to-peer -peer very much, and then we bring a lot of, we do remote visits and then monitoring as well, soon as well. Thank you. Which parts are you doing yourself? Are you, are you doing all sorts of visits or are you leaving those to the third parties maybe? Yes. Uh, which part? like the visits and... Uh... Yeah, so we, do, we have a, a platform model. We have, a, we have hundreds of nurses, physiotherapists, podiatrists, home doctors, and also some are, part of, some are produced by companies, say like a cleaning company, so we have partnerships with them. So we orchestrate everything, vet every professional that they're high quality, and we, we check them. So obviously there's a lot you can do remote with technology when it comes to understanding a person's health. Would you mind explaining a bit more your, the tech part in your offering? So yep. how much information about the patients do you gather and, and what sort of data points do you, um, you know, cover? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are super important things. Like That's what we really want to bring. So one part is that we have this family portal where you can sort out everything from putting the, putting the home in place and paperwork and rule books and everything. So that's one, one thing. And then we have a customer facing for the family members, also for the client side. We have one user interface for them so they can know who is going there, what, they, what they're doing, and so on. So you get it for full transparency on that. And then we have an app for the helpers as well, everyone who's delivering that. So those three elements are really, really crucial for a great all-round user experience. I know you skipped Sweden, and we can talk about that perhaps offline, but for any country where you're going to launch, can you yeah. talk a bit about your strategy for how you get started? Yeah, so uh, Europe has uh, multiple different types of countries and setups there. So. We've categorized them into four different, uh, different types, and uh, of course it's most easy to go in there where you can do private pay fully and get the foothold quickly, and then you can ramp up public pay, whether it's municipality-based or if it's insurance-based, and where the taxation goes in, so you, you, both those markets. And in terms of the service provider piece, since you are working with partners, can you talk a bit about that as well? Not just who's going to pay, but who's going to actually be on the other side? Yeah, so we have both private practitioners, like, and then we have uh, companies. So, it's a, so we bring both of those into the platform to help. And also a lot of the, the IoT part. So we integrate, the, we, we provide for us, we provide safety, safety bracelets and, and stuff like that also. So being really the ones who integrate the offline and online part there. And it's important to, to bring all those together. And I think there's a, we have a big role there because there's so many IoT providers, so many content providers for elder care, so many IoT providers. Someone needs to go through them and check which are the best ones and how to integrate them. Because as a family member, you can't just know which one of the 10 sensors you should choose. Thanks, that's informative. Um, how much does it cost? Yeah, so uh, for us, we're praying it's hourly based, depending on the service, of course. And in most countries, like in Finland, you have uh, like tax subsidi subsidies, you have something from pensions, and you might even have service vouchers. Or if you're in an insurance company, insurance-based com country like Germany, you have in-kind benefits. So after those, it's typically around 10 to 20 euros per hour that you're spending. And that's the same. Like if you if you go to most of the markets like Finland or others, you always have a self-paying component. Even if you take it in-kind, there's some part you need to pay as a family member, and that's typically around 10 to 20 euros per hour per care. That's awesome. I don't think we have any more questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And that is a wrap for the final pitches. Let's have one more round of applause for all of our finalists right here. <laughs>